We're in 2 Corinthians today. We're going to be looking together at uh, verses 8 through 14. And as is my method of teaching, what I'll do is I'll remind you of some of the things that we already looked at. Because every time I teach, there will be somebody who wasn't part of the previous study. So this is to help those who weren't with us last week. And uh, I'll give you some things just to remind you and to lay a foundation. Then we'll move into the actual study of the verses before us. So let me begin reading at verse 8. I'll read to verse 11, though we're going to go to verse 14 today. I'll read verses 8 through 11, and we'll get into our study. First, uh, rather, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8, reading to verse 11. Paul writes, We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired, even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So let me give you a bit of a rehearsal of what we've gone through and then move into our study today, a study that concentrates on verses 8 through 14. But remember with me that as we looked at this passage and introduced it, Paul had just told the Corinthians, in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1, that, that God is the one who comforts us, he said, in all of our tribulation. And then in verse 5, he referred to this as the sufferings of Christ. So God comforts us in all our tribulation, and he refers to them as the sufferings of Christ. Now, there's a, a misunderstanding sometimes, and I wanted to develop an introduction to explain this. Uh, there's a misunderstanding of the phrase, the sufferings of Christ. You see, some people think he's speaking of, of the suffering that we may go through as we serve the Lord, suffering for our faith. And, and others have gone so far as to say the sufferings of Christ would speak of us adding to his redemption through any suffering that we endure as Christians. And, and that's not what he's speaking of in particular. What he's saying is, is we have entered into what is called the fellowship of suffering. In other words, troubles are part of the Christian life. We can, and, and as believers, we often do suffer. This is something that we have been prepared for. It, 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 when we suffer, it shouldn't be something. When we go through affliction or trouble or whatever, it shouldn't be something that takes us by surprise. And yet there are a lot of people who they get saved and they begin to walk with the Lord and then something happens that upsets them, something painful in life. And they may immediately think, oh, I've done something wrong, or I'm in sin, or whatever. And they get taken by surprise by it. But we, we aren't to be taken by surprise by the various things we go through. Uh, sometimes our suffering is simply just part of being a, a Christian. Uh, it's sometimes it's just part of just life itself. You see, to, to follow Jesus is to be put in a position of experiencing hardship. That's what happens. And it shouldn't be surprising to us because we know there's a purpose in the afflictions we experience. In 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, the apostle said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Don't think it's strange. Don't be taken by surprise because the Lord is working through all of this. You see, there's a purpose of it, and he points it out in verse 6. If we're afflicted, he said, it's for your consolation and salvation. If we're afflicted, it's so that we might minister to you. We're being equipped that we might comfort others because they too go through hard times, and, and so Paul's patient endurance is a testimony to them and he's saying to them, hang in there and become settled in your faith and don't be moved because of the things that you endure. In verse 7, he said, our hope for you is steadfast. Uh, the depth of consolation that we experience balances the depth of suffering that we endure. 
and understand that. You see, our patient endurance in our tribulation and affliction will, will have two results. One, it equips us to encourage others because they see our response and they see the spiritual growth that we've experienced through that. And, and second, uh, when you go through something, it, it teaches you to be an encouragement to others also. And so that's what Paul had been speaking about up to this point. And, and, and now he begins to address some of the gossip that is being spread about him. You see what happened in the church early in its history, infiltrators had entered into the church, people who, who were not uh, solid believers in Christ at all. They had come into the church, and, and as they did so, they began to spread lies, spreading lies and accusations against Paul with the hope to undermine the love the people had in the church for him and in doing so would undermine his authority and they could replace his teaching with their own. And so they came in in order to spread lies to undermine him as well as the message of the gospel because the strength of the gospel very often is, uh, is, is going to be evidenced by its promise to transform lives. And if the person who's preaching the gospel's life is not transformed, then you can call into question the power of the message you give that you say transforms uh, versus the way you really live. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to undermine Paul by saying he doesn't live up to the things that he's teaching. And they're spreading these lies. They're attempting to get people to listen to him in order that they might start a problem in the church. Proverbs 26, 21 says, as charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. And that's what they're doing. They enter in causing strife. They're kindling strife. And they knew if they could undermine his credibility, they could discredit his message. Because receiving the message of salvation, Paul felt it necessary to answer his uh, accusations that had been lodged by his critics. You see, this uproar was over Paul's ministry impact on, on, on the people, and they wanted to undermine that. And so that's what they're doing. They're attempting to undermine Paul because the message is so important. What they began to do is attack the messenger so that they might be able to say, well, look at Paul. There's something wrong with this guy, so why would you listen to him? His message has to be as corrupt as he is. And so that's what he's about to do. He's about to defend his ministry. He's about to give some explanations. So he says in verse 8, um, we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, we Americans have a, a lot of problems with certain words, and if that word is used towards us, it bothers us. And one of the words that might bother us is if somebody looks at you and says, you're ignorant. Um, I, I don't know about you, but that's an insult normally, right? You're ignorant. Man, don't be so ignorant. Well, the word ignorant used properly simply means without information or without knowledge. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, I don't want you to be without information. I don't want you to be without knowledge concerning these things. And so he begins by saying, I don't want you to be unlearned. I want to explain to you some things. And that's what he's doing. And so he's speaking concerning what has happened. And notice he speaks in verse 8 of a trouble. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Well, this trouble that he's speaking of is unnamed. Notice here in 2 Corinthians, he doesn't mention what it is. But there are those commentators who think that he's referring to a riot that occurred when he was in the city of Ephesus that is recorded in the book of Acts 19, verses 23 through 41. It was an uproar that was over Paul's ministry impact on idolatry, especially the worship of Diana. And, and when he came and he ministered and all, the city was in an uproar. And it may be that he's speaking concerning this. And as this took place, he says in verse 8, that the trouble took its toll on him. He said, we were burdened beyond measure, above strength. In other words, we experienced incredible stress above human ability to, to endure it. He, he speaks concerning despair. Notice he says in verse 8, the last portion, he says, so that we despaired even of life. That's how much problem, that's how much suffering, that's how much uh, he went through, so much pain. We despaired. 
That word despaired means the total unavailability of an exit from oppression. We were hemmed in. There was nothing I could do. We got to the point of realizing there's no escaping. There's no way I can get out of this. There's no way I can be uh, set free from this. I have no way to, to survive. He said we despaired. You see, the Corinthians were unaware of this stress. So Paul begins to inform them of it. And they knew he'd gone through difficulties, but they didn't understand the personal cost. So he may be saying, though, though you're aware of my affliction, you're ignorant of the cost I've paid. Now, that's normal, by the way. We know that. How could somebody know all the details of somebody else's life? Spiritual unawareness or immaturity sometimes blinds us to the cost that is paid by others. So Paul is saying, I don't want you to be without information. I want you to know what, what took place. And I want you to know that in, in the face of all of this, I have remained faithful to Jesus, and I've remained strong in my love for you. In verse 9, he says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised us the dead who delivered us from so great a death, does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. We had the sentence. That word sentence is a judicial sentence. It's an official verdict with no hope of reprieve. We came to a place of no human hope. We were without strength to save ourselves. And I like this letter very much because it shows the humanity of the Apostle Paul. It was at this point, he said, when we despaired, we were locked in. There was no hope. It was at this point that God delivered us. It was at this point that God stepped in. You see, sometimes we're put in a position by the Lord. We're placed in this position where we, we discover that there's nothing we can do. It, it's a place where you're on your face perhaps praying in your room or maybe in your car as you're driving to work or wherever it may be, and you're beginning to, to think of the various things that are in opposition to you, the, the difficulties you're going through, the hardships that you're facing, the concerns that you have. And it's at that point when you begin to despair. It's at that point when you begin to say, I don't see an escape. I don't see a way to get out of this. I don't know what to do. Well, uh, Paul says this is what happened. He said we have the sentence of death in ourselves. But there was a purpose, notice in verse 9, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. We worship a God who is alive. We worship a God who can take us through these circumstances and these situations. And because he's a God who is alive and raises the dead, he can, t he can raise us out of our problems too. If you understand that you have a God who brings life, if you understand that you have a God who delivers, if you understand that you have a God that nothing is too hard for, you're going to trust him to the very end. And that's what Paul is saying. Understand this. You look at your problem. Wait a minute. I worship a God who gives life to the dead. Is this something he can't do? Is this something he can't step into and fix? Is this something too hard for him? The Lord says, I am the Lord. There's nothing too hard for me. Is there anything too difficult for me? Is there anything I can't accomplish? Look, at they took my son, they put him on a cross, they buried him for three days, but on the third day I rose him from the dead. Are you telling me I can't do something in your life? We have to understand that because the church has forgotten that. Our circumstances and our problems sometimes are larger than that, than that rock that was placed in the tomb. But God had to move that rock so we could know there's life. And he'll, he'll move the rocks in your life too if you hold fast to him, if you trust him, if you don't let go. And you say, oh, that's pie in the sky by and by, Pastor Dave. No, it's not. That's Christianity. If there's anything the church needs to remember is we have a life-giving God. We have a God who can deliver us. There's nothing too hard for him. If he could, he could cause a virgin to have a baby and life to a dead man, what can he do in your life? God can do works in you. We have to learn to trust him. We have to learn to wait on him. And Paul is saying that. Paul is saying, my God raises the dead. He said we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. All of our ideas, our schemes, our ways of getting through and doing everything. No, we don't trust in ourselves. We trust in God who raises the dead. We came to the place of no human hope. We were without strength to save ourselves. 
In Psalm 116, verses 8 and 9, the psalmist said, For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living, that we should not trust in ourselves, he says, but God who raises the dead. God raises the dead. Therefore, he's able to rescue Paul from death's grip. Now, what did God remind him of, and, and what does he want them to learn? He wants them to learn not to trust in their own abilities to deliver themselves. They need to learn to trust in God's ability to deliver, to deliver them. And that's the heart of the Christian faith, trusting in the Lord with all of your heart. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said it like this. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. And Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without him, I can do nothing. But through him, I can do all things. And that's what Paul is teaching us in this passage. We have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, in our schemes, in our flesh, in our own efforts. We need to trust in God who raises the dead. And then in verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death, does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. He delivered us does deliver us, and will deliver us. Past, present, future. God has been faithful to you in the past. God is being faithful to you in your present. And God will remain faithful in the future. I look at my past and I see what God has done. I look at my now and I see what he is doing. And I look to my future knowing that he is going to continue to work. He begins, continues, and finishes the works that he's doing in our lives. And Paul says, I know this is a God who has delivered. I know that this is a God who delivers. And I know that this is a God who will continue to deliver. He is faithful. He's been faithful in the past. He's faithful right now. He will continue to be faithful in the future. Psalm 34, verse 4 says, I sought the Lord. He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. In 2 Peter 2, 9, the first portion of the scripture says, the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials. God knows how to rescue you. God knows how to work with you. God knows how to bring you to the end. God knows how to do that. He has done it in the past. He does it now. He will do it in the future. All you need to do is remember how faithful he's been in the past. Where did you begin? What have you seen God do? And remember that. Don't forget the good works of the Lord. Don't forget what you were before you got saved. Don't forget where you were when, when you heard that message and how you were living. Now, some of you may have been very good people. I have a couple of them in this church. But most were like me, knuckleheads, doing stupid things, living a stupid life. And yet God was good, and God was merciful, and God was forgiving, and God showed us his love. And God said, old things are passed away. Behold, I will make all things new. And my past is now buried and I'm alive in Jesus Christ. And I look back to those days. And I remember what I was like. And I remember what I used to do. And I thank God for the rescue. How that Jesus Christ died and set me free. And how he put my feet on a solid rock and moved me in a straight path. And transformed me in such a way that even my family was touched by that because they saw that this crazy kid is now walking straight. And other people who knew me from high school, they saw what I was, what I did, and then they, 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 they now uh, walk, see me walk straight. You know, I mentioned I meet with a couple of friends uh, every month uh, or so, and um, one of those friends, his name is Art. And uh, Art was sharing with us just his last, last uh, Thursday. We meet once a month if we can on a Thursday, and we were meeting this last Thursday, and, and Art was sitting in my office, and, and he told the guys, he said, I sat in this church for months. He comes to our fellowship. He said, I sat in this church for months, 
and I saw him preaching. I've known Art since I was 14. He said, I saw him preaching. And I thought, I told my wife, I knew a guy named David Rosales. I went to high school with him. What an odd coincidence. He didn't realize it was me. He didn't realize it was me. And he was a crazy kid, and so was I. We hung around in high school, did crazy things. And he's looking at me. What a transformation. No, I didn't outgrow my sin. Some guys, oh, I thought you're too old to sin anymore. No, there's no sinner like an old sinner. No, you don't outgrow sin. You refine it. You lie when you're five years old, you get caught. When you're older, you can lie, and you don't get caught. Why? You refine your sin. You get caught when you, you're a kid, you stole something, and you got caught. Why? Because you don't know how to steal. You keep working at it, you can be a politician. <laughs> you work at it. You get good at it. You don't outgrow it. You don't outgrow it. You die to it. You turn away from it. You're transformed because of Jesus. What you were at one time, you're not anymore. We've seen those cardboard, they call them cardboard, cardboard testimonies, where somebody will walk up and hold a cardboard uh, statement on it, you know, was, you know, a bank robber, was a murderer. I mean, they'll put their, then they turn around and they'll say, new in Christ or something. We had a cardboard testimony uh, for an evening service uh, years ago now. And I, I just, it just comes to mind. Now, all of these people came up holding their cardboard testimonies. And then I went up to share that, that evening message. And I still remember I, I came up and I had a cardboard testimony here and I lifted it up and I held it to the congregation. And it said, drunk, uh, liar, uh, thief, uh, druggie. That was my testimony. And then I turned it around and it says, pastor. And that's what God does. He, he takes the off scouring and he washes and cleanses you and he gives you new life. And that's what Paul is saying. We have a delivering God. We have a God who in the past has delivered us. We have a God in the present who delivers us. And we have a God who will deliver us to the very end. And that's why even though I'm in a position of despairing, knowing there's no escape, I have a God who will take me through it no matter what. And I will stand on the other side victorious because of what God can do. And that's what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. You don't know this. You don't understand this. He says, but this is, uh, let me fill you in. He's saying, these are things you're ignorant of. I don't want you to be without knowledge, but this is what God has done. And as he's sharing that, he says in verse 11, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So he trusts that God will continue delivering them because of the continuing prayer. What he's endured may turn to blessings because of their prayer for him. So he's comforted. He's encouraged by their prayer and is actually encouraging for them to pray more. You see, Paul knew that God would continue to deliver him. God doesn't deliver you one time and not in the future. God knows. He knew that God would continue to deliver. In 2 Timothy 4.18, he said, The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, though this is true, he still knew that spiritual work was accomplished by prayer. Spiritual work is accomplished through spiritual means. It's not done by the flesh. We'll see that in a minute, but it's through spiritual means. And that's why in Ephesians chapter 6, 19 and 20, Paul said, pray for me. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I need your prayers, he's saying, and keep me in prayer. He said in verse 11, that thanks may be given by many persons on behalf for the gift, on our behalf for the gift granted to us. So in requesting their continued prayer, he's reinforcing a loving relationship. He, in telling them that he has suffered much, he, he's provoking their affection for him. He's not asking them to pity him. He is reminding them of his selflessness. 
And he's saying, you, you shouldn't listen to the gossip of the false teachers who are attacking me. Now, this gift that he speaks about, the gift granted, well, the gift granted to him was his deliverance from danger and from the suffering that he was speaking of. And so as he's introducing this, now we're going to get to a part that I was sharing with you in my introduction. I mentioned to you that when you read the, sec the, the letter of 2 Corinthians, I mentioned to you that it's his most open-hearted, Paul's most open-hearted um, letter. I mentioned to you that throughout this letter, Paul actually responds to accusations, false charges that had been made by infiltrators. And, and as I've gone through 2 Corinthians, uh, I've seen at least 24 times, and we'll see these, uh, 24 times that he's answering an accusation. And you'll see uh, the way he formulates his words. You'll actually see that he is, he is answering something that has been said concerning him. And, and we're about to go into so the first two accusations that he responds to. And so there had been at least 24 accusations that had been lodged against him. And again, why did they make these kinds of accusations? Well, well they did so in order to undermine him, in order that they may replace him as the spiritual leaders of the church in Corinth. So that's a common tactic. It's a common tactic to attack the person if you want to undermine them. You don't have to oppose the teaching. What you do is just simply oppose the teacher. And we're going to see a variety of criticisms launched against Paul throughout this letter. Uh, one, I'll give one example. One example will be found in chapter 10. And this shows you how the attacks are more personal than theological. Because in that particular uh, portion, uh, they, they attack him and say he's, he's unattractive and he's boring. Now, no minister of the word wants to be called ugly and boring. It's just not a good thing. But that's what they called him in 2, Timothy, uh, rather, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. This is what they said. His letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. His bodily presence, he's kind of like a, uh, he's a weakling. He has no strength about him. He's not the kind of man that you hear speak and you say, now that's a guy I can follow. In, in Calvary Chapel, we have guys that you look at them and you say, that guy's a man's man. You know, Ken Graves from Bangor, Maine. Whenever some of you guys know him, that guy bellows like a moose. He's a big old guy and he wears real tight T-shirts, I think. Well, anyway, he, but he's got this real baritone when he speaks, and he's a man's man. And then you see others who don't have that kind of presence. And so they'd say, well, you know, that when Ken shares, you know, I just, I can see the authority in that man. But then when guys like you, little wimpy guys, like, and that's what they were saying about Paul. And they were saying that, that Paul's boring. And everybody knows that entertainment is king in church, right? Got to be something I like for 45, 50 minutes. Everybody knows that. So they're saying that about him. He's boring. I get tired. I look at him. He bugs me. He's ugly. And then I have to listen to that. And that's what he's doing. That's what, that is the practical reality of what's going on. So that tactic of, of attacking the, the message by attacking the messenger is an ancient tactic. If you can't attack and undermine the accomplishment, attack the person. That is a very, very common to this day, means of undermining. And that's what they were doing. So we're about to look at, at two of the charges that they brought against him. The one is, is that he's selfish and carnal. He's fleshly. And, and two, that he exaggerates his accomplishments using stories, and he isn't plain speaking. So that brings us to the place of addressing the first charge, verse 12. Our boasting is this the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. The first charge, his opponents are saying that he's selfish, he's hypocritical, and he's carnal. He uses fleshly wisdom. 
These things that they're saying are intended to steal the hearts of the people. These people didn't love the Corinthians. They wanted to take advantage of them. Paul makes that clear later on in chapter 11. Because in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 20, he says to the Corinthians, you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. So these people did not love them at all. They wanted to take advantage of them. And that's how they want to uh, undermine Paul. So he's addressing what they've said about him. And so how does he do that? Verse 12, our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity. Our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience. When he uses the word boasting, he's saying my confidence, my reason for boasting, my, my exaltation is this. Paul had examined his own motives. He trusted that they were pure. In, in Job 23, 11, Job said, my, my foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. Paul was saying the same thing. And though he was being judged, he knew that the ultimate judge was God. Man was judging him, but he knew that the ultimate judge was his God. He said it in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. With me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I know nothing against myself. Yet I'm not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. So he says, I have a boasting, a place of boasting. But notice what he's boasting in. He's noticing, uh, he's noting his conscience. What is the conscience? You know, sometimes people speak about conscience and they think that the conscience can save you, but it can't. A conscience is basically what has been called a moral barometer. It's what distinguishes between what is good and what is bad. That's your conscience. But your conscience is not the same as the Holy Spirit. Because you could be living in a place where certain sinful behaviors are acceptable to the people, but not acceptable to God. So the conscience doesn't save you. It accuses you or it excuses you. It's the Spirit of God convicting you through the Word of God that awakens you to what is true and what is real and what is right. But in this case, Paul is saying, I can boast in the testimony of my conscience. And I can boast that it's clean. You see, for keeping his conscience clean to Paul, that was of utmost importance. He says in Acts 24, 16, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men. Now, part of the reason for keeping a clean conscience, it makes you confident when you teach. Hypocrisy undermines the power of the preacher and it undermines the power of the message. If a person is saying that he believes this, but lives in an opposite way, that's called hypocrisy. And if somebody hears him in a, in a pulpit and then sees him living in public differently, then he has reason to call that person into question. My son Joseph went to the Bible college in Marietta many years ago now. And at the college, Calvary Chapel Bible College, he made friends and he told me a story of how that he had met a young man and became friends with him. And the young man eventually told Joseph, I feel sorry for you. And Joseph said, why? He says, because you see your father the way he really is, the way he is outside of that pulpit. And Joseph came and told me that. He said, Dad, this guy said he feels sorry for me because he sees the way you live outside of the pulpit. I said, really? I said, and what did you say to him? And he said, I told him my father is the same in the pulpit as he is in his home. You see, when, when my kids grew up, I didn't have the Pastor David face and then the regular guy face. I'm just who I am because I'm a Christian. First and foremost, long before I became a pastor, I was a believer in Jesus Christ. And you live for Jesus no matter where you are, no matter what you're called. We are believers in Christ. And so the preaching I do from this pulpit is the devotional life I gave to my children. And when I would raise my kids, I gave them devotions and I treated it like it was my church. I even received offerings. They never gave. They were cheap. <laughs> None of them would work in the children's ministry. But, you know, I did my best. Because I believe, I believe nobody's perfect. I'm not pretending I am. Forgive me if it sounds that way. But I believe that the power of the preacher and his proclamation 
is hinged on the reality of his life living out the things he teaches. And that's what Paul said. He said, my boasting is my clean conscience. You've seen my life before you. I haven't lived in one way here and another way there. And the testimony of my conscience and my life are combined to present to you the reality of my faith. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, that Paul would make it clear that teachers were to have good character. A teacher was to have uh, a life that was without reproach. He was to have a, a good reputation amongst everybody, including those who were not followers of Christ. In 1 Timothy 3, 7, uh, Paul said he, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, speaking of outside the church, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. He's to have a good testimony inside and outside of that church. And so Paul said, my conscience is clear because I live in simplicity and godly sincerity. Now, the word simplicity speaks of being without selfishness or pretense or hypocrisy. He said, I'm the real deal. I live before you as an open book. In Psalm 51, 6, surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. So he lived without selfishness or pretense. He was not a hypocrite. And secondly, he said godly sincerity. Godly sincerity speaks of a perfect openness. It speaks of purity of motives. What you see is what you get. I was sincere, and I didn't hide behind um, something that was not true in order to, to take advantage of you. And so he says, this is my boast. This is my confidence the testimony of my conscience. We conducted, we lived in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity and not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you, not with fleshly wisdom. Fleshly wisdom speaks of carnal thinking, carnal thinking that's not concerned with God's glory. Fleshly wisdom is grounded in the flesh. It's, it's grounded in, in profit, in pleasure, in worldly honor. It's based on devising plans to promote themselves or their cause, not the cause of Jesus. You know, on uh, Facebook, I read it and I read the news feed. I was mentioning this yesterday um, in our, um, our servants class. And somebody had written, uh, pastors, you know, use the Disneyland uh, methodology to grow your church. And it's called the Disneyland methodology. And, and so I made a comment. Uh, I said, yeah, using the Disneyland methodology, I made mean, on this guy's page, using the Disneyland uh, methodology means that the pastor is goofy and the church is Mickey Mouse. So we, we don't follow devices of man, strategies, to try and make this an entertaining place. It's a magical kingdom. There's so many people who are buying into that methodology. Listen, my pastor taught me something I think is biblically true. And my pastor said, if, if you feed the word of God, healthy sheep will beget sheep. If you want to see the church grow, it's not in numbers. It's in the spiritual lives of the people. And if you love them and give them the truth and they take that and give it to others, you will see a multiplication. You will see people getting saved. You'll see the church being healthy. You'll see things happening that are good because these people are being grounded in God's word. But if it's your idea to have a lot of people show up in a church so that you can call yourself successful, you have a lot of filled pews with empty people. What you really need are Christians who love Christ, who are willing to do the work of ministry, to go out and, and preach the gospel to the lost and see people's lives transformed because that's all that really matters. And that's what Paul is talking about. That's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the fact that this is how it works. I haven't relied on fleshly wisdom. Uh, I, I haven't done this. I, I have that clean conscience I spoke to you about, and, and I'm pursuing the Lord. And that's why you can, you can judge my conduct before you. I live out the message that I'm giving, and my life is open. I love you. And, and that's why he's taking the time to answer the charges. In 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he says it like this, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I'm loved. His words and his works lined up. He relied on God completely. And so, no, I don't use fleshly wisdom. He says, but I rely on the grace of God and because I love you more abundantly towards you. And then he says in verse 13, for we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. I trust you will understand even to the end. Now, this is the second lie, the second charge 
that has been circulated about Paul. And the charge, the false teachers are saying he tells stories and he doesn't speak plainly. We are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand you write. One of my commentators that I use as I prepare Bible studies is a man by the name of Ellicott. And he paraphrased this. And Ellicott said, I have no hidden meaning in what I write and you read. What you read, you read correctly in its plain and simple sense. There are no innuendos. My speech is straight. There are no hidden meanings. I'm not trying to impress people with fantastic stories. I'm not teaching my personal opinions to make me look important. I'm not writing with worldly cunning. I'm not evasive in how I minister to you. You can trust what I have told you. I have no hidden motive. I'm not fabricating exciting stories to win your admiration. But I want to tell you about Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, he said to them, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I don't want you to be looking at me, Paul is saying, in some fleshly way. Listen, today we, we live in, a, in a, a generation, it appears to me, that is longing for hero figures, somebody to stand up and, 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 and be the brave heart of this generation, go out there and, and, and win victories. And, and, and I may not do it, but I'd like to have somebody, some champion who will do it on my behalf. And so what happens is we begin to idolize certain individuals who seem to be doing things we can't do ourselves. And we champion them. But that's not how it's supposed to be. God has given to you gifts and a calling. God has given to you the power of his Holy Spirit. He's given you his word. God has given you opportunities. God has given to you the things that you need to go out and fight and win and be victorious. And ultimately to stand and to say, I have in Christ. I have overcome. I am more than a conqueror. You don't need to look to me to be your hero. you got one in heaven. His name is Jesus. And what he wants to do is he wants to use you. You see, that's how it works. You don't need to look to me. I have clay feet. I will fail. I have failed. But he never does. You keep your eyes on the one who matters. That's Jesus Christ. And me, I don't want to be the hero of the church. I want to be a servant of the Lord. I want to follow Christ. I want to love my wife. I want to love my children. I want to love my grandchildren. I want to feed my sheep. I want to be a good pastor, but I don't need to be the master. I need to be the servant. Jesus Christ needs to be the master. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I'm not making up stories. I'm not the hero of my own illustrations. There are so many, unfortunately. And I don't speak poorly against my brothers and all of the Lord. If it sounds that way, forgive me. I don't intend it to, but I'll tell you, I have seen too many men who have gotten caught up with their success to the point that they forget to tell people about Jesus. It's all about him, guys. Jesus isn't boring. Jesus, following Christ is amazing. Following Jesus, a transformed life. Look around what God has done in your own life. Look at what God has done in you. What you were. What you did. And what you are now, think about it. What has God done in you? He has changed you. He took you from the miry clay and he put your feet on the solid rock. You were a liar, perhaps. Maybe you were a thief. Maybe you were into the drugs. Maybe you were immoral. Maybe you were hot-tempered, violent. Maybe you were a gangster. Maybe you were that real good person who was jealous and envious and covetous of so many things. Nobody knew what was in your heart because you always smiled and looked so kind. But inside, you knew you were a monster. You knew it. And then God grabbed hold of your heart by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, I can change you from the inside and I can make you absolutely new. And you became a follower of Jesus Christ. And now it's all about him. It's all about him. And one of the ways that you can know whether or not you're in the right place, because we have people who bounce from place to place. You know, oh, I'm going to try this place for all. I'll try this place for all. One of the ways you can know if you're in the right place to grow is when you walk out as Jesus become more dear to you. 
When you take your walk with your friends and you're talking about church, if you're talking about how Christ changes lives and what God does in the answering of prayer and how valuable and wonderful his word is, you know you're in the right place because you're learning about Jesus Christ who can transform lives, who has transformed your life, has equipped you for works of service and is using you for his kingdom. That's how you know. And Paul could point to himself and he could say, I'm not making up stories. I'm not the hero of my own illustration. I'm not asking people to come and follow after me. I would say unto you, imitate me as I imitate him. Follow him because he's the one that matters. And these false people entering in were saying, oh, look at him. He exaggerates his successes. Look at him. He's the kind of person that you really can't trust. And he's saying that's not true at all. He says the whole bottom line is for you to know Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and we close with these things in verse 13 and 14. And he says, now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. I trust you'll understand even to the end. I'm confident that you will acknowledge I'm telling you the truth. I trust you will know that my teachings about Jesus can be trusted to the very end. And also, as he says in verse 14, as also you have understood us in part, what I'm telling you is something that you have partial knowledge of. But my hope is that in telling you these things, you'll gain more understanding. You see, we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. On that day, you will recognize that you have as much reason to be proud of me as I have to be proud of you. When we stand before Jesus, we're going to be proud of each other. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, what is our hope, our joy, the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. And so we just want to share of what God has done. And so together, at the end, when you hold fast to the teachings you've received, on that day that we see Jesus, and together we will, we'll be proud of each other, of what you have done for him and what I accomplished for him. But it's all been for him. Paul wasn't the hero. He was the servant. And these men were coming in saying, he's nothing. And he says, of course I'm nothing, because he's everything. But I love you, he was saying to the Corinthians, and they will use you. So that's the heart of a pastor who is willing to put his neck on the line for people who are willing to hear the lies. Because it's easier for the church to listen and believe the lie than it is to believe the truth. And Paul has to speak and say, no, I've loved you. They don't. This is what I've gone through. And they haven't. You can trust me because I love you. And that's the heart of a pastor.